the Theology of the Body Institute, this is the Ask Christopher West Podcast. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Ask Christopher West Podcast, co-hosted, or even hosted, shall we say, yes. by my beloved wife, Wendy. We're doing something a little different this time. We are on YouTube. We're in our YouTube studio. For those who are listening via audio only, come check out this episode, which is on our YouTube channel. We have a link in the show notes for our audio listeners. And for those who are familiar with our YouTube and are tuning in as normal to our YouTube channel here at the TOB Institute, you may want to check out the nearly 200 episodes of the Ask Christopher West podcast. People from around the world submit questions, and Wendy and I answer them together. I usually go first, and then she chimes in with the real nuggets of wisdom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it has been a blessing for us to do this together. Yeah, and it's fun to do it in a new format here in our relatively new and redesigned YouTube studios. So, Wendy, yeah. thank you for coming on, and welcome to our YouTube studios. Oh, thank you. Indeed. And do you have any updates about things going on with the Theology of the Body Institute? I do. Um, for those, again, tuning in via YouTube, this is what we typically do on our podcast. We have a little chit-chat at the begin beginning, and then uh, we make some announcements about things coming up at the Institute, and then we get in. We usually do about three questions mm -hmm. per episode. So, yes, things going on at the TOB Institute. We have some exciting courses coming up in the fall. We have a Theology of the Body Level 1 course online. Uh, if you have never taken TOB1 and you've been wanting to go more deeply into John Paul II's teaching, this is the place to come. Check out the link uh, below, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're listening. There's a link for either of you. And then we have TOB2 Live, which I'll be teaching here at Black Rock Retreat Center in October, first week of October. You have to have taken TOB1 to take TOB2. I say to my students... Each course that we offer is five days, five and a half days, 30 hours of classroom time. And I say to my students, after you've been in class for 60 hours mm -hmm. learning TOB in TOB1 and TOB2, you now have a decent introduction mm. to what John Paul II has given us. That is how rich, deep, and extensive this mm -hmm. vision goes. And it is well worth making the deep dive. Then we have in November, we are offering the... Theology of the Body and the Interior Life, where we bring together Ignatian spirituality with John Paul II's teaching. We, we marry those two. That's going to be taught by one of the, certainly in the United States and even globally, one of the greatest experts on Ignatian teaching today, Father Timothy Gallagher, will be teaching that. So check it out. Uh, check out our course schedule to, to learn more. And I'd also say, check out our calendar of made for more events we're going to be taking john paul's teaching on the road uh, we come out into parishes around the country see if we're coming to your area check out the link there that gives the dates and places of our made for more events this fall and something we always enjoy when uh, students are coming to these in-person events is to learn who are the YouTube viewers who are the podcast listeners and to actually meet the yeah, people and know to whom we're speaking. And we just, it helps us so much in our podcasting to have knowledge of who's listening to us and what their story is yeah. and, and who whom they're sharing the episodes with. All of that is really encouraging for it us. It makes it more incarnational, yes, absolutely, to meet, meet the people who are listening to what we're doing. So thank you listeners for tuning mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question for you from a patron. Very good. We always start with a question from patrons for those who are tuning in for the first time here on YouTube. And if you want to learn more about becoming a patron and the many benefits that we offer our patrons, you can check out the link as well to that. Mm -hmm. This is from Christy. Hello, Christy. I teach a Theology of the Body class to high school seniors. One observation I've made is that many of us are unaware that we're supposed to be fighting a spiritual battle. Sin is seen as inevitable, and we're not trying to get better, just not get any worse. In order to help my students recognize the battle, I've been using parts of C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape, 
screw tape letters. Great. Good. In the opening scene of conversations between two demons, Uncle Screwtape advises his nephew to keep the humans focused away from logic and on jargon. Mm. Jargon, my boy, not argument, is your best ally in keeping him from the church. Wow. My question to you is, what jargon do you think is keeping us from seeing and hearing the actual truth? Awesome question. Uh, Christy, right? Yes. Thank you, Christy, for submitting that question. And I love that you are looking for creative ways to reach your students. Mm -hmm. And I think this is absolutely crucial that we, we paint a picture of the story we are involved in. Why do we love stories? What, what stories do we love the most? I mean, I look at my own life as a boy, what stories captured my heart? I was almost eight years old when Star Wars came out, and it rocked my world. And what's at the heart of it? Good versus evil. Um, then I got my world rocked by the Rocky movies, you know, and there's always the good guy and the bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. There's Rocky versus Apollo Creed, there's Rocky versus um, Clubber Lang, there's Rocky versus Drago, you know, there, there's always the good guys and the bad guys, whether it's the Western or the superhero genre or whatever it is. I mean, the stuff of stories is the good guys versus the bad guys, good versus evil. When we don't know that, we, that all of those other stories that we are, ourselves make up with our own artistic creativity... When we don't realize that that's not just fairy tale land, the battle between good and evil, that there are re real forces, a real war, a real battle between good and evil, and it's raging in our own hearts, then we, we won't know that we are part of the greatest story ever told, uh, the battle between good and evil, which is the battle between God's kingdom and the kingdom of these fallen angels, the head of the fallen angels being Lucifer himself. Uh, you know, one of the, the main ways that the enemy deceives us is by convincing us that he's not real, that he doesn't exist. He exists. We are in a war. Now, this is also very important, and I am going to get more specifically to answering this question, mm -hmm. but I, I need to give this background to, to say what I, what I to, to answer this question. Let's put this context between the, the battle between good and evil in its proper context. Mm -hmm. It is not a question like who's going to win. I'll often tell my students, you know, I, I've seen these memes that float around, so called Christian memes that are actually heretical, where you like see like Jesus and Satan arm wrestling and they're both flexing their muscles and they're both sweating at the brow and you're like, you know, the question's like, well, geez, who's going to win here? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. A better image is Satan is a little, tiny, annoying mosquito. Mm -hmm. And Christ looks at the mosquito and swat, he's done. He's squashed. He's, he's defeated. The distance between good and evil here, the distance between God and Satan it's it's not a, a com competition between powers where you wonder who's going to win. Uh, God is omnipotent. God is the creator. Satan is a creature. The battle has been definitively fought and definitively won. But we live in in the kind of what seems like slow motion reality of that hand going down to swat that mosquito. You know, if you can imagine that in slow motion, like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the hand's coming down and you splat. And, and we're, we're in that history is that kind of slow-mo, when will the victory that has already been won be realized in, in history, mm -hmm. in our own lives? Well, we can enter into that really and truly day to day by the decisions we make. And, and what Christy said here uh, about, uh, what did she say? We don't want to necessarily overcome sin. We just want to not, yeah, how did I think she put it? She's describing her students' attitudes. She said, sin is seen as inevitable. We're not trying to get better, just not get any worse. Right. Well, there's only two directions here. There's no standstill. 
Mm-hmm. You're either advancing in the victory or you're, you're what's the opposite of advancing? I can't find Retreating or, or receding or falling in the, in the other direction. You're going one direction or the other. You're not standing still here. And the deeper we go backwards here, the deeper is the pit that we need to climb out of mm-hmm. if we want to go forward in the victory. Can you reread some of this question? Because I'm, I'm, I've got lost in my own thoughts here, and I, sure. I kind of can't even remember what she asked. Yes, that's okay. This happens so, to me sometimes. <laughs> in order to help students recognize the battle. Yeah. She's used the screw tape letters. Screw tape letters, right. Oh, and then jargon. Uncle Screw Tape advises his nephew to right, keep right. the humans focused away from logic and on jargon. And right, then and then what quote. is the jargon? Yes. So, okay. So let's paint the battle a little bit more clearly here. So we know what war we're fighting. What, what war are we engaged in? In order to win a war, you have to know who's fighting, why he's fighting, what he's after, uh, what tactics he's using, and then you, you can understand the plan for mm-hmm. defeating. What is Satan after? Scripture says that Satan fell out of envy. Well, we've talked about this in other episodes, but it's worth revisiting. Envy is different than jealousy. Jealousy says, I wish I had what you have. But envy says, I hate that you have it, and I want you to hate that you have it too. That's that more devious nature of envy. Jealousy is also devious, but envy deviates even more. Mm. I hate that you have it, and I want you to hate that you have it. Well, what's the difference between the human being and the angels? What do we have that the angels don't have? Bodies. Bodies. Why would Satan be envious of our bodies? Because our bodies, this is at the very heart of everything Christianity proposes to the world. If we don't get this, we don't get Christianity. We are destined for a bodily participation in the Trinitarian ecstasy of divine life-giving love. Mm. That is the destiny of the incarnate human person. Theologians, mystics, saints have, have surmised that Satan, as the most beautiful, he was Lucifer, right? What does Lucifer mean? Angel of light. He was the most beautiful angel God created. God only creates things that are true, good, and beautiful. But he also gave the angels freedom, like he gave us freedom, and the brightest of all angels abused his freedom, became ugly, became the father of lies. Rather than being true, good, and beautiful, he becomes the father of lies. He becomes evil. He becomes ugly, right? By his own free will. But what led him to abuse his freedom is he fell out of envy. And the saints, the theologians, the mystics surmise that Lucifer saw this vision of God's plan that the second person of the Trinity would take flesh and raise human flesh to the level of participation in the eternal ecstasy of the Trinity. As Christ goes, so goes his bride. Right? Why did Christ te- take flesh? To wed himself to us in the flesh. And this is why scripture describes heaven as a wedding. Christ and the church, their marriage, the marriage between the two, the marriage between divinity and humanity, consummated in Christ, is forever consummated in eternity. And now we have the proper understanding, or the light that shines for us, a proper understanding on what this battle is and why it's focused on our bodies. God created us male and female and called the two to become one flesh, St. Paul tells us, to be a sign of the mega mystery of the eternal plan, which is human life would be wed to divine life and the human body through this marriage would participate in the eternal ecstasy of the Trinity. The angels don't get to do that. The angels don't have bodies. They don't get to participate in this. 
the call to be fruitful and multiply, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. That call of the two to become one flesh, that call of the two to, to bring new life into the world, angels can't do that because they don't have bodies. We get to participate even here on earth. There's a, a sacramental participation in the marriage relationship in the eternal life of the Trinity. That's what sex is in the divine plan. That's our bodily destiny. And this is why Satan hates, hates, hates our bodies, hates that we are created male and female, hates our fertility, and he always plays the same card. He wants us to hate it as well. I mean, when I was a kid and I saw Star Wars, I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. When I saw the Rocky movies, I wanted to be Rocky Balboa. I wanted to be a player in this drama between the good guys and the bad guys. Well, guess what? We all have an indispensable role to play in this greatest story ever told. And, and if this teacher can, if Christy, if you can invite your students into that battle, if you can reveal to them, help them see that they are part of this cosmic battle between good and evil, they will come to see the jargon that is out there that distracts us from logic. What is logic ultimately? We get the word logic from the Greek word logos. And what is Christianity about? Christianity is about the logos made flesh. In English, we say the word made flesh, but that's a translation of the word logos. The Greek word logos is much richer. It means the logic behind everything, the meaning behind everything, the purpose behind everything, the beauty, the design, the plan behind everything. That plan, that purpose, that logic was made flesh. Why? To show us in our flesh the ultimate logic, purpose, and meaning of everything. Jargon in the world today your body's meaningless, love is love, uh, a marriage equality. The, the, that's all jargon that robs us of our logic. Mm. It robs us of our love of wisdom. And another name for love of wisdom is philosophy, mm -hmm. love of wisdom. And one of the greatest definitions of philosophy I've ever heard is the art of of making meaningful distinctions. The slogan or the jargon, love is love, for example, or sexual freedom would be another one. But let's go with, let's go with love is love. That's a, a phrase tossed out. And at, hey, at the surface hearing, hearing that at the surface, well, yeah, I'm, I'm all for equality. Equality does not mean sameness. And when we say things like love is love, and we really press in with logic and with love of wisdom, we need to make some meaningful distinctions. The fundamental distinction in human experience is the distinction between male and female. And what a man and a woman can do with their bodies let's be more specific, mm -hmm. what a man and a woman can do with their genitals is meaningfully distinct from what two men can do with their genitals, from what two women can do with their genitals. When we make meaningless distinctions is when we, we, we rightly react with, well, that's, that's a meaningless distinction. Why are you making that distinction? Mm -hmm. For example, it's a meaningless distinction uh, to say that blind people, because they're blind, they have no right to vote. Well, why are you making that uh, distinction mm -hmm. with, about blind people? Blindness has nothing to do right. with, with the ability to vote. But it is a meaningful distinction to point out that blind people cannot drive cars, and therefore the state is right not to issue blind people driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. That's a meaningful distinction. The sexual difference is a meaningful distinction. It's, there's nothing more meaningful 
because the two becoming one flesh is the very foundation of human existence. Let's go back to love is love. What's really being said there, if you press in, is what two men do with their genitals together is the same thing as what a man and a woman are doing with their genitals together. That's really what's being said, if you get down to the, the foundation of it all. And that is a lack of love of wisdom. It is a, it is a failure to make a meaningful distinction, to recognize a meaningful distinction. And it's a lack of logic. And that lack of logic is masked by jargon. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is what Christie's getting at. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Wendy? Yeah. I said a lot there, but I, I thought it warranted some background. It did. That was really powerful stuff. A lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, I think the main thing that I'm just wanting to share is that uh, another phrase that I think it kind of ties back into what you're talking about that is sort of jargon. And by jargon, I guess what I mean is sort of words that are kind of loaded by certain people in the know. Right, right. And um, the phrase, check your privilege, is kind of coming mm. to mind, where I, I know that sometimes a person will make a comment that sounds critical of some other person person or group or culture or something and um there's a there's sort of like this police force out right. there saying oh check your privilege like you cannot say a meaningful thing about that because you are coming like as if your personal bias is so overwhelming right. that you can't right. possibly have anything to say to people who don't have that same background or privilege but I was struck by your talking about that longing to be part of the battle, to yeah, be to yeah. have a role to play. Uh, when you talked about wanting to be Luke Skywalker, right. that 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 voice that says "check your privilege" is almost like a a, a foot stamping yeah. out that genuine spark of wanting to enter into the yeah. truth, yeah. and it's like, nope. Nope, you can't participate, you can't talk, you can't say anything. And and that means that whatever you've actually said or written is completely disregarded. And that is a, a tactic of the enemy yep. to keep you from remaining engaged in what's going on. And it, it causes a lot of discouragement because our hearts are meant to long to be yeah. on the side of truth and moving toward truth and spreading truth and goodness and if those attempts are repeatedly responded to with such a an attack it can discourage us yeah yeah and it's a it's a it's a i don't want to look at the real argument mm -hmm. you're offering so i'm going to dismiss you mm -hmm. uh from from the get-go so i don't have to look right. at your argument right and, and I want to say one more thing about this love is love or marriage equality jargon and how it masks things. And to do that, I, I, we have to look at the effect of contraception on the way we see the sexual difference. The impact and effect of contraception is to nullify the essential meaning of the sexual difference. At the most basic fundamental level, the purpose of the sexual difference at the natural level the very word natural means birth, natus, mm. to give birth to. That's the natural meaning of the sexual difference, to bring a child to birth. When you view the sexual difference through contraceptive lenses or condom-colored glasses, as I often say, you nullify that distinction. And it's only within that paradigm, the contraceptive paradigm, that you can say love is love. And within that paradigm, guess what? What two men are doing with their genitals is the same thing that a man and a woman are doing with their rendered sterile genitals, right? Contracepted genitals. In a contraceptive paradigm, that's true. But when you, know, when you remove contraception from the paradigm, and for those who are listening and not watching on YouTube, I'm raising one hand up in the air. It is impossible, when you remove contraception from the paradigm, it's impossible to raise what two men are doing with their genitals or two women to the same level as what a man and a woman are doing with their genitals. So it's not the same thing. 
but it is not impossible to lower what a man and a woman are doing to the same level as what mm. two men or two women are doing, which is the pursuit of sterile pleasure. So it's not that we can raise homosexual activity to the level of the marriage bond. Rather, we can and we have lowered what we understand marriage to be to the level of what two men or two women are doing with their genitals. That's what contraception has done to the way we see the world. It's erased the fundamental meaning of the sexual difference. So maybe the Catholic Church isn't crazy after all in saying contraception is damaging to our humanity and to the meaning of, of the love of, of a man and a woman. Mm. So just hold that out. Shall we go to the next question? I have the next question ready for you. All right, let's do it. This is from an anonymous listener to our podcast. I recently heard the phrase marriage debt from a prominent Catholic priest. Having, having taken TOB1, I do not recall that phrase being used. What is marriage debt? Is that still a concept the church teaches or uses? And how does it fit with TOB? I'm so glad this question was asked. In, in almost 200 episodes, I don't think we've ever addressed this, and I'm very, very happy to address it. The idea of marriage, the marriage debt is taken from one of St. Paul's letters where he says the, the husband's body does not belong to himself, it belongs to his wife, and the wife's body does not belong to herself, it belongs to her husband. And Certain translations may have rendered something St. Paul said in that context as uh, rendering the debt, rendering the marriage debt, which is the marital act. Is there a way to understand that language correctly? In our, in our, to our modern ear, that language immediately sounds uh, perfunctory, duty-bound, mm -hmm. even subject to, to uh, like automatically subject to seriously abuse, serious abuse. You owe me sex, right? And you got to pay the debt. Mm. Ugh. Blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't, ugh. <laughs> it, if we're in that zone in thinking about the language of the marriage debt, mm -hmm. if we're in that zone, if we're coming, if we're attaching that meaning to it, if we're coming from that approach, it is not an exaggeration to say John Paul II and his whole vision uh, is diametrically opposed to that understanding of the marriage debt, that you owe me something and you better pay up and I want it tonight. Mm, so that feeling of like a collector that is, yeah. can threaten you into paying. Right. Or something this is, like this is utterly contrary to the dignity of the person, right? So it can't mean that. That it is utterly contrary, that approach is utterly contrary to the dignity of the person. But what could it mean? How can we understand that in a proper way? St. Paul says, the husband's body does not belong to himself, it belongs to his wife. The wife's body does not belong to herself, it belongs to her husband. And spouses should not deny one another except for an occasion, he says. And there may be all kinds of occasions that warrant that, no, tonight is not a good night for the marital embrace. But that idea that my body does not belong to me, it belongs to you, Wendy, because you're my wife, it belongs to you in as much as I have made, and here's the key word, a free gift of myself to you. And your body belongs to me, not in a possessive ownership, like I take it, it's mine, I demand it, but I receive your body person as a gift because you have freely offered your body person to me as a gift. And here in this context, John Paul II in his Theology of the Body speaks of the language in the Song of Songs, my beloved belongs to me and I belong to him. Mm -hmm. The wife says that in the Song of Songs. My beloved belongs to me and I belong to him. Well, there's a proper way to understand that word belonging and an improper word to understand that word belonging, an improper way to understand that word belonging. And it's the same with the word debt, Yeah. right? I belong to you, Wendy, because I have freely given myself to you. 
in, in imitation of Christ. St. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He said, this is my body given for you, given freely. They do not take my life from me. I lay it down freely. I freely place my life in your hands. That's the marriage commitment, to freely say, I give my body up for you. And the freedom of the gift, this is an expression of John Paul II, the freedom of the gift must always be respected, not just on the wedding day. Well, you said on the wedding day that you gave yourself to me, and so I'm taking it now. No, no, throughout every, every day, every hour, every moment of married life, through the whole span of years that you remain married, you must respect the freedom of the gift. You cannot demand the other make the gift. You must respect the freedom of the gift. And John Paul talks about this also in his reflection on the Song of Songs. The expression, uh, you are a garden enclosed, my sister, my bride. A garden enclosed, a fountain sealed. John Paul has a beautiful reflection on that when he says that the bridegroom recognizing his bride as a garden enclosed means he recognizes her as master of her own mystery. The bridegroom in the Song of Songs longs, and you can feel his longing. He longs to enter the garden, the inner mystery of his wife, to plant his seed in the garden. That metaphor is very revealing when you enter into mm-hmm. the imagery of it. He, he, he knocks on the garden gate. He, he says, open to me, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew. Open to me, open to me. He's presenting his longing to her, but he stands at the gate of the garden and knocks, right? Just like Christ the bridegroom. He stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. He will never barge in. If the bridegroom were to barge in through that garden gate or demand that the bride uh, surrender the key, and if he in any way would fail to respect her as master of her own mystery, then we would have a violation of freedom, and we would have a, a, a distorted, uh, corrupt understanding of possession, uh, of belonging. Belonging is only in keeping with the dignity of the person, and the same can be said of the idea of the marriage debt. Uh, it is o- that idea of debt or belonging or possessing is only in keeping with the dignity of the person when throughout the course of married life, husband and wife respect the freedom of the gift. That's how, that's, that's how John Paul II would, would put it. I think it's important also to remember that that kind of tender consideration for one another is available to everyone. Amen. You don't need a certain level of education Amen. or a certain type of life experience and you don't there, need to know how to articulate it or put it in words. You don't need to know these words at all. Right. That that is simply a way of saying, here's the grace is given to you to love one another. You need to stay open to grace. You need to have your eyes open to who this person is that I'm loving. And that open eyes of the heart is really what this concept of marriage debt I feel is calling me to, is to um, both, you know, just to be tuned in to who you are as my husband and and how I'm called to be a gift to you. Also, my eyes open to myself and how you need to know how you can be a gift to me and that we communicate that lovingly and respond to the grace that's available to us. Amen. That's our calling. What do we owe one another? We owe one another love. Yeah. And love is impossible without respect for the other person's freedom. Yeah. So we have one more question. Let's see what the final question is. Drum roll, please. (laughs) For people new, and if you're tuning in here on YouTube, the way this typically works is that, well, typically, always, Wendy is the one who screens these questions. She goes through, we get questions from around the world, and she goes through them. And I'm hearing them cold, so I've never heard these questions before. So what's the third one, Wendy? 
Interestingly, I didn't know what we were going to say about the last question. The third question kind of ties in. Oh, good. This is an anonymous, a question from an anonymous listener. I have really deep wounds in my wiring around mm. sexual touch and my ability to love and be loved. Mm. They stem from many sources, starting with the conditional love of my earthly father through sexual abuse by a teacher during mercy. my teen years. Mercy, mercy. And later, my first husband abandoning our marriage. I'm so sorry, mercy. That marriage was annulled, and I remarried in the church to a wonderful and loving man who's very hurt by my inability to express and receive sexual love. Mm. Mm. I have prayed for healing. I beg God for the ability to love my husband as he deserves and desires to be loved. But I'm so exhausted. I despair of ever being healed in this lifetime. I feel invalidated by my husband who takes my behavior as a personal rejection of him, even though he knows the source. Yes. How can I share with him these deep wounds without giving details that will not be helpful? I'm so afraid that if he learns of what I allowed to happen to me, he will not be able to love me anymore. Bless you, dear sister. I know, I know these wounds go very, very deep, and I'm sure it seems right now like a, a big tangled mess that may seem almost hopeless. How do we get out of all these tangled knots? Mm. That's kind of my image, like a, I see a bunch of fishing line or something that's all tangled up, and it's like you throw up your hands, you're like, there's no way we can untangle this. This is so convoluted and painful, and, and how do we get out? Well, one of the titles of the Blessed Mother is, and I love it, is Undoer of Knots. Mm -hmm. I invite you, dear sister, dear sister, I invite you to open those wounds, those fears, those questions, those longings to your Blessed Mother and and surrender them to her give her that if that image is helpful to you of a bunch of fishing line kind of all tangled up uh, just to, to surrender that tangled up mess and say mary i can't do it but i ask you please to untie these knots that might be a, a starting point starting place i hope you're um i hope you are seeking counseling some form of therapy or at a minimum, some wise spiritual direction here from a wise spiritual director to help you enter into these wounds and how to experience healing. Uh, if you're if you're not already, please check the list of counselors and therapists that we recommend here at the Theology of the Body Institute. If you're listening to the podcast, it's in the show notes. If you're watching here on YouTube, we'll we'll list those here in the description of this video. You're going to need some some counseling. You're going to need some therapy if you haven't already been receiving it. I'm also going to hold out this. Um, we have a course coming up at the end of January 2023 at the Theology of the Body Institute. We are teaming up with Desert Stream Ministries. Uh, Andrew Kamiski and his team will be coming here in, to Pennsylvania to Black Rock Retreat Center to do for the second time for the Theology of the Body Institute a five-day course called Sexual Healing and Integration, or Sexual Redemption and Integration, one or the other. Um, point is the same either way. They take people through a series of exercises and presentations and small group conversations to really jumpstart that process of inner healing. There's going to be some hard work required of you and of your husband to seek the healing that you both need here, but it is not impossible to go on that journey, and the Theology of the Body Institute, in conjunction with other people we work with, counselors, Desert Stream Ministries, uh, we also have a, a great working relationship with the John Paul II Healing Center in Tallahassee, Florida. We'll put that link for you. We'll make that available to you as well to look into the programs they offer. And both of those organizations, Desert Stream Ministries and the John Paul II Healing Center, for our patrons, we have on the patron website 
a short retreat uh, that you can do it in one day. We have a retreat that we offered with Desert Stream Ministries and a retreat that we offered with Bob Schutz and the John Paul II Healing Center. And I never want money to get in the way. If you need access to those two retreats, speaking specifically to this person and anybody else who may be in need, uh, and you're not able to pay the $10 a month to be a patron, I never want money to get in the way. Send us an email or go to our podcast uh, and just let us know that you're in need, and we'll, we'll get you links to those retreats free of charge. My goal is just to get this information out there. If you're able to support our ministry for $10 a month, uh, you can get access to those retreats and several other retreats as well that I think you will find very, very helpful on the healing journey. I'm going to say one thing about one comment you made, and then I'm going to pass it off to Wendy. You said you find it very difficult to receive touch. Can you read that again, love, that one line? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking over the question. Yeah. Um, I have deep wounds in my wiring around sexual touch and my ability to love and be loved. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, to touch on. Mm -hmm. Christ healed through physical touch. That's how he healed. Think of so many scenes in the gospel where he lays his hands on people, or he even more strangely and and it can seem so odd to us if you really enter into the story. You know, we we it comes up in the cycle of readings, for example, that Jesus spits on somebody's tongue and now the mute can speak, or he he turns dirt into mud with his own saliva and then smears it on the guy's eyes. Or he, he, he pulls this deaf person aside and he puts his fingers in his ears. The healing that we need in our bodies comes from one source, the body of Christ. How do we heal from unholy touch? We overcome evil with good. We are healed by un, from unholy touch by holy touch. And the only 100% pure, 100% no alloy in the gold whatsoever, the only 100% holy, 100% pure touch is the touch of Jesus Christ. And that touch reaches us today in the here and now through the sacraments of the church through the laying on of hands. That's how the sacraments reach us. It's, it's All the sacraments are physical encounters. The laying on of hands in, in confirmation, in ordination, the bathing of the body with water, baptism, anointing of the body with oil. Uh, there's that in baptism, in ordination, in confirmation, uh, confessing our sins with our own lips to another incarnate person right in front of us, and the laying on of hands in the absolution, uh, the eating and drinking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Think of the, the intimacy. <laughs> if the Eucharist is real, then every time we go to Mass and receive the Eucharist, Jesus is touching our tongue. <laughs> our tongue. If the Eucharist is real, our tongue is where the touch of God happens most intimately. Holy touch sacred touch, healing touch. That's what heals us. That's the sacramental life of the church. So I, I invite this listener to go to the Eucharist with a, a, a new sense of placing on the altar these fears, these questions, these wounds, wounds, these blocks, and let Jesus touch you there. Let Jesus heal you there. Let Jesus bless you there through the sacraments. What are your thoughts, Wendy? Mm, I, I absolutely agree with your your recommendation of counseling in the sense um, of how how it can seem, as she said. Um, let me just find the word. Sorry, it, it just struck me like kind of a despair or a, a hopelessness about um, what can happen. I'm exhausted. I despair of being healed in this lifetime. So. Oh, what compassion we all feel for that place of just being, I keep trying and I don't know, I don't know if, yeah. I'm, if there's any progress. And I think that's what counseling can help us so much is to kind of give us a, a next step, 
and a next step. And sometimes if we're just looking for the end goal where all the sensitivity around the wounds is completely healed, um, we can just get easily discouraged because that's, that's kind of way down the path and we can't as easily appreciate, but we've taken this step. And this grace has been given and opened us up to the next small step. And I think that's that's a beautiful gift that you can experience in counseling is that someone who can reflect back to you, well, here's a place to start and here's how you start. And here's, let's rejoice when we see the good that comes from just beginning here. Um, So I have experienced that in my life and in spiritual direction of just... uh, meeting with someone who could see me i want to be over there i don't like where i am and and her just lovingly just saying okay just leave that over there Mm. let's take you on the next step right here here's what you need to know first here's the place where we begin um so i want to encourage you in that and also i just want to um point out something so gently because I I wouldn't want someone to feel that I am critical. I think you have actually a beautiful insight into your husband here that is a gift. And I think the evil one wants to twist it and make it into one more wounding thing where you talked about my husband takes my behavior as a personal rejection of him, even though he knows the source. Mm -hmm. There's... um, that I just see the evil one twisting up something that could be really beautiful, which is just an insight of how important it is to stay on this healing journey because of how important are the consolation we're meant to give one another on the journey yes, as yes. husbands and wives is to each of us personally. And just as you're feeling unable to, console him as a wife and he's feeling this inability to console you as he's your husband consoling his wife that insight that i see what she needs i see what he needs and i i'm failing at it is a gift yes yes to know it and to allow that to open that to one another and to the lord and just ask for grace in those moments even if the grace is just tears of being on the same journey together yes yes and those tears of being on the same journey are so unifying right and that's that possibility of that being unifying rather than dividing is what i wanted to good point wendy i i can think of countless times in our marriage where there's been a little rift between us where i felt not understood by you you felt not understood by me sure and one of us reaches out to the other in that time to say a kind word or a word of understanding. And it, so many times you've done that for me, and it, my heart just melts. Uh, and I, I might suggest to this listener that just to put your hand on your husband's shoulder and say, I, 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 I know this is hard. I'm, uh, please, please know that I love you, and, and I want to work towards deeper unification with you, Mm -hmm. unity with you, deeper bond in our marriage. Just some word of acknowledgement, this is hard, but we're in it together. Mm -hmm. I understand it's hard to to be, because I'm so wounded, it's it's hard for you that I don't know how to show affection in, 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 in ways that I know would, that you would long for. Just some word of understanding can go a long way Mm -hmm. of doing exactly what you just said, turning a situation that could be uh, dividing you into a situation that can be unifying, unifying, uniting you, mm-hmm. right? That's that's a beautiful work of grace when those moments happen. Mm-hmm. Wow. Why don't we, can, would you lead us in a prayer, Wendy, for, for this couple? And, and if everybody out there watching or listening, if you would mm-hmm. just, maybe we could all commit to lift this couple up in prayer in mm-hmm. a particular way. Mm-hmm. Lord, you know these two unique, unrepeatable hearts of this husband and wife, and yet you know how many of us can relate to so many things, whether we've experienced them to a lesser degree or to a greater degree, we can relate to what they're going through and that it's the 
the struggle of a human heart to work in this imperfect world, to be patient with the process, to stay committed, to find the help that is needed on this journey. So we lift them up to you. We lift all married couples up to you and ask for a great outpouring of grace in their lives. That they would have the gift of spiritual eyes to see one another as a beautiful gift, a precious, unrepeatable gift, and to embrace once again, to take up once again the journey that they've promised to be on together of, of growing closer to you and to the people you made them to be through this sacrament of marriage. Yes, ask you Lord. to bring holy counselors and um, just loving, deep friends into their lives that can encourage them on this journey, help them bear the burdens that they're bearing. I ask for deep healing to take place in both their hearts. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, this has been fun doing a little cross-pollination with our YouTube channel and our podcast. If you are familiar with our YouTube channel, go check out our podcast. If you're familiar with our audio podcast, come over to YouTube and check out all the videos we have on YouTube. Till next time, may you know it in your bones. You are a gift. Become what you are. Ask Christopher West is brought to you by the Theology of the Body Institute with music by Mike Mangione. Christopher and Wendy hope that the information provided is helpful to you, but remind you that they are not licensed counselors. If you are going through serious difficulty, a list of trusted counselors and psychologists can be found in the show notes.